Good morning, um, I'm Madhu Lal Nag. I am the program lead for the Research Governance Council with the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the FDA. Um, well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today about um, alternative predictive solutions, especially when it comes to therapeutic development. And I'd like to start today by talking a little bit about the utility of complex in vitro models or microphysiological systems in therapeutic development, uh, both from a perspective of uh, the need to develop these models uh, and uh, the regulatory perspective in the development of these models. This audience needs no introduction to the fact that the therapeutic development com community does in fact need a paradigm shift uh, into ad adopting uh, the development of models that accurately recapitulate disease biology. So what do I really mean by that? What is this need for alternative predictive models and how does that fit into the, uh, the, the pipeline or the roadmap for therapeutic development? So as you can see, um, we, we start off with finding and validating a target, generating a hit, you know, there's the whole process of clinical development, and then um, we, um, uh, it comes to the regulatory agencies for approval. If we look at the R&D costs um, for some of the biggest therapeutic areas, which, is, which are cancer and uh, sort of immunotherapeutics, between 2009 and 2018, the median cost of developing a, a new drug was 985 million. The average sum has totaled, you know, 1.3 billion, and obviously we're taking uh, into account, uh, you know, the costs of attrition into these numbers. Nevertheless, this is a huge investment, and uh, you know, it really behooves us as a community to understand what the return on investment um, on on developing therapeutics is not so much for the pharmaceutical industry, but for the primary stakeholders of drug development, which are um, which are the patients. So uh, what I'd like to sort of focus um, a little bit today is on the mindset that uh, has sort of gone into the development of these alternative solutions. Um, initially in the academic space, then um, adoption by pharmaceutical companies um, and those involved in drug development, and then the interaction with the regulatory space and, and sort of really understanding what that regulatory need looks like. So when we think about the process of drug discovery, uh, it's it's multifaceted in nature. You know, uh, for the most part, we've started off um, in, in the discovery space with with effectiveness in in vitro models, uh, very very simple in vitro models, and then gone on to your very typical animal models, phase one, phase two, phase three trials, and then looking at post uh, post market safety assessment post-approval. However, the amount of money that we spend uh, in therapeutic development, in research and development, uh, is, is extremely large. And it's also the biggest resource sink in terms of the amount of time that's spent uh, for therapeutic development. So, if there was a way to reduce the time that we spend in research and development by, by developing more predictive models, the time to approval of a new drug, especially when, um, when we are uh, uh, met with cases that do not have any other alternative diseases for which there are no drugs, uh, underserved patient populations, uh, developing these predictive models, both from the efficacy as well as the toxicology perspective, can go a long way in reducing the amount of time that we need for approval and getting better drugs to patients faster with the same amount of stringency put into the regulatory process. So when we look at the technology for assessing the risk of drugs and compare it to some other things that we might be familiar with, if you think about, you know, the span of, of 80, 80 years, we've made tremendous leaps and bounds in, in many technologies. When you think of the, you know, um, of aviation, when you think of the cars that we drive today. However, when we think about therapeutic development, we are still very much using the same tried and tested safety pharmacology models, whether or not they actually accurately 
uh, recapitulate disease biology. So this really necessitates a paradigm shift, not just from those involved directly in therapeutic development, but also from other stakeholders in the research community, which includes the regulatory agencies to understand where and how we need alternative solutions and what these alternative solutions look like. So I'll, I'll um, talk a little bit more about these alternative solutions in the context of addressing the complementary roles of regulatory science and translational science in the development of physiologically relevant models. Now, when we talk about advanced complex in vitro models, or we talk about microphysiological systems, what we are really talking about at at its very core are systems where you can actually recapitulate intercellular and intracellular uh, responses and interactions that you would expect to see in an actual human tissue. Um, the term microphysiological model is, is very, um, is, is, is very all-encompassing, if you will, and encompasses many different complex in vitro models. Some people use it exclusively to describe an organ on a chip, but by its very definition, it is any model that introduces and recapitulates intercellular interactions, not just within a cell itself, but within the cell and its environment. So today, in terms of efficacy testing, as well as um, safety and toxicology, we look at spheroids, we look at organoids, where you bring in organ structure, we look at bioprinted tissues and organ on a chip. And one of the things on the academic um, uh, and, and CRO side of things is to understand that there is a trade-off between physiological complexity and high throughput screening. Uh, for, for the past, I would say, five to 10 years, the advent of high throughput screening has really turned drug discovery on, on its ear. I mean, the ability to screen so many compounds and compare them sort of in a one-to-one -one scenario is tremendous. However, one has to keep in mind that when you're in, in, introducing more complex biology, you don't necessarily want uh, too much throughput because at the end of the day, uh, if you keep increase, increasing throughput, you lose out on the biology. So for a lot of groups, it really is understanding where that trade-off is, what your model is, what question you're developing the model to answer, and what throughput you really need. When we think about um, diversity in disease, uh, one of the traditional problems in therapeutic development has been that in the models that we have, they're very homogenous. So whether you're looking at 2D monolayer cultures or you're looking at immunocompromised mice that have been genetically engineered to overexpress or underexpress a particular protein, this is not representative of the way the disease manifests in a normal human population. So how do we how do we overcome this? Um, a part of it has been to be to develop predictive models that actually use patient derived cells uh, themselves in um, using sort of iPSC derived cells as well, because with these models and with genetic engineer genome engineering techniques like RNAi and CRISPR, what we're able to do is represent the disease heterogeneity that you actually see in a patient population so that eventually when you are able to get a therapeutic into, um, into clinical trials, the chance of attrition is much less because you're actually, you've actually tested it in predictive systems that are representative of the disease heterogeneity. Now, this of course is more relevant in diseases like cancer, especially the epithelial cancers, which are not not always driven by driver mutations, uh, where you can have a lot of heterogeneity, heterogeneity between the stage of the disease and from patient to patient, depending on what their other comorbidities are. Uh, for the rarer diseases, for many pediatric diseases that are very genetically driven, this is um, the, some of the some of the models that are in use today are um, are still very useful. Nevertheless, as a community, it does behoove us to think about predictive solutions across the for multiple diseases. 
So what does drug discovery in the third dimension look like? As I, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, you know, we, we think about using microphysiological systems as a catch-all phrase, uh, which it is in some respects, but we have to um, uh, understand what each kind of microphysiological system actually brings to the table. And by that, what I mean is understanding the actual question that you're asking of a particular model and how that reflects the disease pathology. Once you understand what part of your disease pathology is being answered by a particular model, you are then able to build almost like in, in a Lego-like fashion, uh, you can build on the different questions that then give you a much bigger picture about how the disease is actually being ameliorated by your uh, intended therapeutic um, that, that's being tested. So what are the couple, what are a couple things, uh, sort of housekeeping things that we have to keep in mind uh, when thinking about moving into microphysiological systems? One of them, which tends to be the most boring, but I can assure you is probably the most important is standardization. Rigorous standardization for the production of both wild type and tissue models, disease tissue models in, in, in lower throughput um, is extremely important because you have to sort of really be able to um, count on the same morphology, viability and relevant tissue function from assay to assay. The other thing that the community should probably keep in mind um, is that we do need to develop methods to quantitate certain disease phenotypes in tissue models because a lot of phenotypic screening is very qualitative. These are um, qualities of cellular interaction that may not be quantitative yet, but it, it is to, off advantage to the community to think about how to quantitate different phenotypes. And um, I think everyone would absolutely benefit tremendously from pharmacological benchmarking. And by this, what I mean is, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the community, both in the academic setting, but also the regulatory setting about the importance of developing standards and understanding from compounds and drugs that have been successful in human beings, how do you use those retrospectively in all of these different complex in vitro models that we're, we're uh, looking at and see what works and what doesn't. And for those compounds that worked and had a, a, a very acceptable safety and toxicity profile in human beings, uh, what models did they fail in and why did they fail most importantly? And then um, having a community get together to, to really look at that data and, and perhaps um, write a white paper for the community would go a long way uh, towards validating the different microphysiological models we are going to use as alternative solutions. The other area that is ripe for um, intervening, especially with alternative solutions, is investigative toxicology. Um, this is a discipline in early discovery that describes the de-risking and the mechanistic eluc elucidation of various toxicities. So basically, it gives you a lot of data that would support early safety decisions in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, outside the boundaries of regulatory toxicology, um, investigative toxicology does have the flexibility to embrace new technologies. So a lot of the microphysiological systems, a lot of the complex in vitro models, um, in combination with in silico modeling approaches can really give us an in vitro to in vivo mechanistic understanding that we, we hope will eventually predict human response. Um, so so uh, ideally the goal of investigative toxicology is to improve preclinical decisions so that for the animal models that are are still in use that we're using to make those decisions, we are supporting and complementing the, the data that uh, comes off of that. And um, I, I'll, I'll stop here to make a very important distinction. Um, even though we're working sort of um, uh, as an entire community towards uh, understanding um, um, and, and filling in the gaps for which no relevant animal models exist, especially in safety uh, uh, pharmacology, the conversation right now is not about 
uh, doing away with animal models. It's about bringing in alternative solutions that can complement the safety pharmacology um, uh, decisions that we make with animal models so that moving forward, we're in a space that we're able to assess which models work better and why. So having said that, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research's approach uh, or mindset with respect to what we call NAMS, New Approach Methodologies. The goals here are really to help us develop pathways that will adhere to the, the three R's, which is reducing and refining uh, the use of animal models and contribute to the development of novel predictive models without changing the current paradigm. So that sort of goes back to what I just said before, um, um, uh, before the slide. And in, in terms of uh, a roadmap for this, um, what we, we'd like to be able to do is develop um, uh, the regulatory use of NAMs and come to a consensus on the context of use for these NAMs and their utility in drug development. So what do I mean by context of use? This is something that I think um, has to be kept front and center, both in the very, very early stages of discovery and then throughout the course of therapeutic development. What is the scientific question that needs to be answered and for what purpose? It, it becomes extremely important for everyone to understand that there are no catch-all models. You cannot develop a microphysiological system model and then say it based on the results from that model that it recapitulates in its entirety the entire disease pathology. Um, once we've understood that we cannot develop a catch-all model for validation, developing multiple models that attack various aspects of the disease um, becomes a much more doable task and, and I think can and really contribute to understanding the mechanism of action of an intended therapeutic target. So what does validation versus qualification look like? Validation is what we do in discovery and screening that we've been talking about um, uh, in terms of the endpoint. And, and qualification really uh, speaks more towards the replacement of pivotal non-clinical safety studies. And the context for every model could be expanded over time. So what are the principles of validation for any system or model that we're looking at? One, of course, is the rationale for the assay, the need and purpose for this particular assay. Uh, what is the relationship of the endpoint of the assay to an in vivo effect of interest? And again, what are the limitations? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. What is the protocol? Uh, what is the intra intra-test variability, rep re repeatability, and reproducibility of the test method? What is the test method's performance uh, with respect to standardized chemicals, as we talked about? The performance of a test method being evaluated in relation to existing relevant toxicity data and data that supports the valid validity should be available for review. So these are some of the things that we want to keep in mind when discussing how to validate certain models. So I'll move now um, into sort of talking about how um, the, the uh, Division for Applied Regulatory Science has thought about uh, some of the evaluations that they do. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, we move in increasing complexity from 2D cultures into 3D organoids, which then moves into sort of microphysiological systems with a, with a one organ system, and then into model multi-organ physiology, where we have interconnected systems and we look at the physiological modeling of, of each organ in and how, and how it interacts with the others. Um, so what, what, one thing I do want to uh, sort of reiterate here is that there's a lot to be learned from each one of these um, systems, uh, whether it comes to really understanding how a particular pathway works in 2D cultures to sort of the, um, the interaction of extracellular um, uh, activities or even sort of um, overexpression of drug transporters in 3D organoids the effect of sheer stress and flow that mimics what's actually happening in a sort of in intravenous flow in microphysiological systems and then how it all comes together in terms of um, uh, understanding the, the in vivo um, interactions. So when, when we think about building microphysiological systems, what's, what's very interesting for us to sort of think about is 
what are the advantages of an in vitro system? Um, as we talked about in the principles of validation, um, these experiments or assays really need to be controllable. You have to have controllable experimental conditions that will then enable it, enable the, the mechanistic understanding of data. If this is not re robust and reproducible um, and we get different safety signals from system to system, it's extremely difficult to evaluate these systems for their utility. Uh, Again, talking about the lack of reproducibility and low robustness basically is the biggest drawback uh, to the, the, the widespread use of cellular microsystems. So if you think about uh, physiological cues that a cell experiences in vitro, Number one is the dimensionality. These are not flat cells. They exist in, in three dimensions. They interact with other cells with cell matrix additions. They, uh, they have specific matrix compositions and, and they have matrix properties. They are um, subject to mechanical stress and fluid flow um, within, within tissues. They have uh, niches of cellular interactions where they are regulated both in a paracrine and an autocrine manner. Um, gradients of nutrients and oxygen can greatly change the way a cell uh, responds to a given chemotherapeutic. And of course, um, growth factors, cytokines, hormones really sort of um, can ch change the, the, the relationship of a cell with um, respect to its, its microenvironment. So there obviously are many, many variables that we have to keep into, sort of take into consideration when evaluating um, uh, from a safety perspective what these platforms would, would bring to the table. So there's variation in device handling, which could mean vari variation in the assembly of the actual device, protein coating, things like priming and pumping of the relevant fluids into these microphysiological devices, changes of media, how the media is changed, by whom the media is changed and how often, and obviously the operational calibration itself. In, with respect to the things that we have to take into consideration with, with the cellular system itself, um, there are so many variables that we need to um, really assess in terms of reproducibility. Um, you know, how these cells are isolated, especially in, in, in the context of patient-derived cells, what are the genetic backgrounds, the different types of media, differentiation protocols, and cell-specific handling. So, so as you can see, sort of developing complex models is no easy task, uh, but making sure that they are really useful is, is even more of a gargantuan task because without robustness and reproducibility, uh, the question of qualifying any of these becomes much, much more difficult. So we really need to be able to uh, see the same results time and time again uh, from the same systems to be able to um, uh, look at it as a, as a viable alternative solution. So in terms of um, what, um, what the regulatory need is from a safety perspective, um, many developers have established handling procedures and culture protocols to optimize systems. And what's been extensively studied are the heart on a chip and a liver on a chip system, where you're looking at bioengineering factors, um, uh, extracellular mechanics, uh, oxygen tens tension, substrate porosity, depending on which organ you're looking at. Um, not only are we looking at uh, single cell types, but also combinations of cell types to test, uh, which, which are um, uh, iPSC derived so that you're able to bring that diversity to the table. So really, um, NIH funded testing centers uh, are now evaluating how to transfer this technology out of uh, developers' laboratories. And the CEDAR DARS laboratories focus on evaluating the potential of these systems for use in drug development. So uh, with respect to both the heart on a chip and the liver on a chip systems, um, they're perturbed with the drugs of interest and then uh, um, assessed for biological function, biomarkers for safety pharmacology, and the various phenotypes that we see with the perturbation with um, the drug of interest. So what we're really looking for is to recapitulate the important pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic um, uh, parameters that we would normally see in an animal model. And that um, uh, includes toxicity, drug absorption distribution, and like I said, PKPD. 
For regulatory use, systems must operate robustly, originate reproducible results, and improve upon the gold standard. If there is no uh, way of, of proving that it is not, in fact, better than what is what is currently in use for the prediction of safety standards, then there, um, um, there is no use in, there's no additional advantage in, in adopting these models. These are what set the criteria for our evaluations. The systems themselves to evaluate should be published systems and preferentially used in different laboratories so that we're able to assess um, the difference in handling from laboratory to laboratory and from person to person. And um, we're also testing commercially available cells with quality control protocols in place to see how they handle. Now, in terms of criteria for evaluating these different systems, regulatory use, as I mentioned, um, uh, Cedar Doris looks at site-to-site -site variability where developers repeat sets of experiments and chip-to-chip -chip variability for the organ on a chip systems to see how different chip batches could affect results. And I'll give you a simple example of uh, the sort of what I mentioned earlier on when I said, you know, we have to really understand the question that we're asking of a particular system, otherwise we're not going to get the right answer. It's not that the system is giving the wrong answer, it's just that the system is not designed to answer the question that we're looking at do an answer for. So an example of that would be, what does liver function look like? So if we're perturbing the liver on a chip with a drug of interest or liver organoids or liver spheroids, and we want to understand how the drug would either ameliorate or worsen the function, the biological function of the liver. Uh, as you can see, when we look at albumin production here on this graph, which is a which is a function of a, which is one of the most important functions of a, uh, of the liver. Neither the spheroid nor the sandwich cultures give us any indication of what, um, of 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 the biological function of the liver. But if you actually grow the 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 cells of interest on a liver chip and look at it over time, you are getting a readout that is very similar to a. a functioning liver, which is the increased production of albumin. So, so really um, uh, what I, I want to reiterate here sort of at the end of the presentation is that it is very, very important to, to understand for a particular readout whether your system is functioning and predictive of its disease model. Um, some of the other things that are, are going to come up in terms of diversity is, is modeling human specific properties with iPSC di differentiated cells. Um, and again, this is, I think, an incredible um, area of progress where we, we should be able to uh, really recapitulate disease biology by using um, iPSC differentiated cells and primary cells from patients to really uh, tailor drug treatment for each patient. And um, uh, one of the other areas, as I mentioned earlier on, in terms of looking at multi-model physiology are the assays of interconnected systems. So here we have looking um, uh, um, uh, data that looks at liver on a chip as well as heart on a chip and what the circuit of, of microphysiological systems look like when you actually have um, um, injury to, to the liver and, and sort of looking at the biomarker profile for the other organs. Uh, to sort of comment on what what the disease pathology um, and and the effect of the drug would be, and um, with that, I would like to um, sort of wrap up with with really making a plea to the community about collaboration. Collaborative efforts in the pre competitive space are absolutely considered necessary to explore and establish these innovative new tools and concepts. It is instrumental that safety assessment is continuously innovated to be able to address new challenges that arise from these drug trends in drug development. And with that, I will um, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions.